I think we should get started. We should get started now. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you for the last uh, lecture at the Center for Philosophy of Science this semester. Uh, and we're going to close with a bang. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, next uh, semester. So the plan as of today is to be back in person at the center. So most lectures will be taking place at the center, but we will be live streaming them on Facebook. So you can always join us on Facebook. And furthermore, we will have uh, at least once a month a Zoom lecture so, so as to be able to reach out to people who uh, are not um, at, at, at peace. So we hope to see uh, most of you in the future uh, either uh, through Facebook or at the center, even better, or on Zoom for the monthly uh, Zoom, Zoom lectures. It's been a really great uh, seminar, uh, semester. I would like to thank all the, all the fellows and postdocs at the center who have made uh, this semester a success despite the uh, fact that we've all been on, on Zoom for, for now four months. Um, so thank you to all, uh, all of you and for the audience who came to all the talks. So today it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce, as I said, the last speaker, a friend of the center. So um, it's really a wonderful way to, uh, to end the, 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 the semester. Karim Khalifa, who is a professor at uh, Middlebury uh, College. Karim, as of course uh, all, all of you uh, know, work in the philosophy of science, but also in epistemology. And he has done a very large amount of, of work at the intersection of these two fields. He's very well known for his work on understanding and for his very influential book published in 2017, Understanding, Explanation, and Scientific Knowledge with Cambridge University Press. But it's uh, a public, uh, a published in a range of other topics in the philosophy of social sciences about uh, explanation, in terms of best explanation about the nature of style, stylized facts, and more recently about uh, race. Uh, so that seems to be a new area of, of, of research with a paper in Philosopher's Imprint, um, publishing all the best journals. Uh, it is won also by his fellowships, including an ACL, an, uh, an American Council of Learned Fellows Fellowship and an uh, NEH uh, also uh, fellowship. So, and he's, as I said, he's come twice to the center and it's been really wonderful to have him uh, uh, with us uh, uh, in Pittsburgh. And uh, today, Karim is going to be talking about uh, Sandy uh, Goldberg, who's a professor of philosophy at Northwestern and who specializes in also uh, epistemology and has also published extensively in uh, uh, epistemology, including more, most recently, Conversational Pressure, Normativity in, speak, in Speech Exchanges. All right, Karim, uh, the floor, or should I say the screen is yours. Uh, for memory, there is a handout in the chat box if you want to download the, uh, uh, the handout. And uh, we will be back in 55 minutes for the q Okay. Thank you very much, Edouard. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to present at the center, as it were. And in this particular case, as in many other cases, uh, uh, the topic of this talk uh, and, and the ideas in this talk were sparked by an event at the center, in this case, the 2019 Workshop on Epistemology of Science, where Sandy and I, I should say Sandy Goldberg and I, because we know that there's only one true Sandy at Pittsburgh. Uh, hello, Ms. Mitchell. Um, uh, Sandy Goldberg and I sparked, uh, uh, had a number of conversations, and this is one of the fruits uh, of those conversations. Uh, I should say this is a first foray into me, uh, for me, into the uh, epistemology or philosophy of measurement. And so I very much am looking forward to uh, uh, being disabused of various misunderstandings. So recent work on measurement focuses on the importance of coherence between theoretical claims, auxiliary hypotheses, measurement outcomes, and instrumentation in establishing the accuracy of a measurement procedure. Uh, and while we think that there's tons that's really useful and insightful about this coherentist approach, which you can find in the work uh, of folks like Hasek Chang, and Aran Tal and Bas van Frassen, Alisa Boklich, Wendy Parker, amongst others. Uh, what we wanna do is sort of expand uh, the epistemological tools that you can use uh, to make sense of different things, uh, uh, different aspects of measurement. Uh, and the approach we're gonna be taking is what we like to call a mosaic conception of metrological justification in which uh, all those coherentist uh, uh, insights are integrated 
uh, with at least two kinds of foundations, uh, which we'll call reliable perceptual foundations and functional foundations. So the plan of attack for today uh, is basically to uh, state exactly what measurement coherentism, what measurement coherentism is, that is the dominant epistemology that we find in the philosophy of metrology, and to also articulate its main motivating uh, argument uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say the, the measurement coherentist sort of has two options, right? Uh, they can either go uh, the modest route in which, uh, which is compatible with the mosaic conception. It's basically to say that coherentism is part of the story about justifying claims concerning measurement, but not the whole story, or they can go whole hog. They can be an ambitious measurement coherentist. We're going to suggest that the uh, ambitious measurement coherentist uh, doesn't seem to have a particularly good case to be made. So with that, the possibility of a mosaic conception of justification and measurement is opened up. And we're gonna uh, advertise two places where we think foundationalist elements can work in tandem with coherentist considerations uh, to uh, give us a, a richer account of how metrological practice works. Uh, and the idea here is uh, both to enhance uh, what's already going on there and maybe to open up uh, avenues for new kinds of questions about measurement. So first, what exactly do we mean when we talk about measurement coherentism? So for the purposes of this talk, coherentism is going to be defined as the doctrine that a statement is justified, at least in part, by its inferential and explanatory relations to other statements within a scientific corpus. Two things I wanna note about this definition. First, note that this is a, a thesis about being uh, justified at least in part. And the reason that we have that caveat in there about uh, the possibility of partial justification is, is at least twofold. First. Um, not many of the measurement coherentists are, are very explicit about how they're defining coherence. Uh, and so this seems to be a charitable way of giving them a fair amount of wiggle room. And second, it's part of the mosaic conception uh, that it's really only in part uh, to some extent um, that, that coherence figures in justification in many cases. Second thing is note that this is indexed to a scientific corpus. Uh, for most of the talk, I'm mostly just gonna rely on your intuitions about what a scientific corpus is. Uh, towards the end, we're gonna have to squint at it a little bit more. And this is certainly something where uh, I think we could use a little bit more uh, uh, um, conversation. So maybe this will come up in Q&A about how to properly delimit these things. So then what's measurement coherentism? Well, that's just the claim that certain statements pertaining to measurement are justified at least in part by their inferential and explanatory relations to other statements within a given scientific corpus. And so the question now is why would you choose to be a measurement coherentist? And I think you can find a wide variety of arguments uh, which are sort of all bearing family resemblance to each other. Uh, and very roughly the flavor of these arguments is something like this. Uh, there seems to be some inescapable circle when you start thinking about how to justify certain kinds of measurement claims. Um, better to make that circle virtuous, that is go coherentist than to make it vicious. Uh, so we'll try to unpack this a little bit more. I'm gonna call these circle of measurement arguments and I'll give you a paradigmatic version of this and I wanna recognize that there are variants in the literature. So um, clearly one thing that we want is we want to have uh, an acceptable process of measurement, right? But in order to do that, we need an empirically successful model uh, of uh, the measurement process uh, that we hope to make access, uh, we hope to accept, right? But of course, empirical success is going to rely on measurement quite a bit. And so it looks like then you're going to end up uh, requiring a process of measurement in order to have an empirically successful model. And it ought to be an acceptable process of measurement. And that in rough outline is the circle. We'll try to dig in a little bit deeper by unpacking some of these terms. Here, we're gonna rely heavily on the work of Aran Tal, uh, who I think very usefully distinguishes between measurement processes and a model uh, of such a process. So what do we mean by a measurement process? We mean a set of physical interactions between the object of interest, the relevant instruments and the environment. So for instance, with a thermometer, this would be me sticking the thermometer underneath my tongue, uh, the column of mercury rising up to the numeral 99. Uh, now, <clears throat> note that I said numeral there because we don't yet have something that counts as a number, much less uh, uh, the temper my, my temperature, right? Uh, the final state of a process is what's called an indication. And because this is merely a set of physical interactions, there's not yet a semantics by which to interpret uh, what's going on just yet, right? For that, you need the model of the measurement process, right? Uh, and uh, a model of a measurement process basically recruits theoretical and statistical assumptions about the measurement process to draw conclusions about a measurement outcome, where a measurement outcome uh, is a knowledge claim describing the object of interest as possessing a relevant measurable quantity. So 
Um, the measurement outcome uh, in the particular example that we're, uh, we're just sort of using as an intuition pump here would be that Kareem's temperature is 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and uh, the general thought is you have to know a little bit about um, the fact that mercury basically expands uh, by an amount that's directly related to the temperature in order to understand how the thermometer works and to actually get that measurement outcome. Uh, now, uh, as I said, we want to talk about the process uh, uh, of a measurement being acceptable to some degree. And I think as a, a first approximation, we can characterize it as follows, that scientists uh, can use a process's indications and relevant background knowledge to make warranted inferences about measurement outcomes paradigmatically for scientific practices such as experiment, prediction, and explanation. And that's what we mean by acceptability. Um, there's various criteria of acceptability, and many of these you will recognize as sort of the usual suspects when we talk about acceptability, things like consistency, scope, simplicity, fruitfulness, and unification. Note that these are also often associated with coherence uh, as well. Um, but when we talk about the epistemology of measurement, frequently precision and accuracy come to the fore for obvious reasons. And, um, now, uh, going back to our circle, we can get a better appreciation of, of uh why it pops up and how you get out of it, basically. So we now see that a process of measurement just gives us an indication. So in order to actually have a measurement outcome to talk about uh, the quantities of interest, we, we're going to need the model. So that gives you CM1, that arrow there, right? CM standing for circle of measurement, right? But of course, uh, an empirically successful model um, as before the intuition should be obvious. It can't be just any old model. It's gotta be a model that makes appropriate predictions. And those are typically going to require measurement. Now, the way to get out of this is basically to introduce multiple processes and, and models uh, of, of measurement. Uh, so uh, the idea here would be often that you have at least two processes of measurement and similarly two models of measurement, uh, and you're expanding the circle. And um, uh, what makes the, uh, the model successful um, is a different process of measurement than the one that you're trying to uh, use to interpret um, the process of measurement. So process of measurement N is interpreted by uh, empirically successful model N. Um, but what vouches for its empirical success might be the process of measurement N minus one. Now, crucially, there's also got to be some fit, right, between the process, the, those two processes of measurement for this to work out. And that's often mediated by even further sorts of claims. And so the, the general intuition here is you're expanding the circle so that it becomes, uh, goes from being vicious to virtuous. And that looks a lot like coherence if it isn't just coherence by another name when we talk about a virtuous circle. And I take it that's the animating idea uh, behind measurement coherentism. And with that, we can ask the question, just how coherentist should you get when you're talking about measurement? And I wanna give you two candidates. Um, the first is what I'll call modest measurement coherentism, which simply holds that some central claims about measurement are justified via coherence. Right? Um, and they cohere with other claims, which might in fact um, not be justified by, by coherence. We'll call those supporting claims. Right? Contrast that with what we'll call ambitious scientific coherentism that basically says all scientific claims are justified via coherence. Uh, so they're going to say that even the supporting claims have to be justified uh, via coherence, uh, whereas the modest measurement coherentist uh, just gets to say only some claims about measurement, uh, central claims perhaps. Uh, now, crucially, exegetically speaking, it doesn't look like you'll find many explicit avowals of ambitious scientific coherentism. So I think the charitable read is that most measurement coherentists are in fact modest, but you can find at least a few hints uh, of ambitious scientific coherentism in the work of Hasek Chang. So here's uh, the kind of quote uh, that makes me think he might be sympathetic to ambitious measurement coherentism, right? He says, in each of my episodes, that is of measurement, justification was only found uh, and the coherence of elements that lack ultimate justifications in themselves. So I want you to just put a pin in the word ultimate there because that's going to be uh, another point of contention a bit later in the talk that maybe there's um, uh, 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 an overworked notion or an overwrought notion of foundationalism that's kicking around in the background. For now, just focus on the word only. It's saying that justification, uh, that, that coherence is the only game in town when it comes to justification. That it tells the whole story and not merely part of the story. Crucially, however, when we look at Chang's arguments, uh, which are basically variants of that circle of measurement argument, what we find is it doesn't support anything as strong as ambitious uh, scientific coherentism, only modest measurement coherentism. And let me give you an example with, I think, one of his most explicit versions of these circles. Right? Uh, so uh, talking about measurement, he says, we want to measure quantity X. Quantity X is not directly observable, so we infer it from another quantity Y, which is directly observable. Right? For that inference, we need a law that expresses X as a function of Y uh, as follows, X equals F of Y. Right? 
Um, but the form of this function f cannot be discovered or tested empirically because that would involve knowing the values of both y and x, and x is the unknown variable that we are trying to measure, right? So it's starting to look like we have a circle now between f and x as a result of this, right? But note that it's only f and x, right? And that there's nothing to say that y itself can't be justified by something other than coherence. Uh, direct observation needn't be a coherentist epistemology of observation, and I don't think that the arguments in Chang uh, uh, suggest uh, anything so strong. So with that, um, it looks like modest measurement coherentism is the way to go. And as I said, this is highly congenial right, to the mosaic conception of justification, where foundationalism and coherentism work together uh, to justify various kinds of, of measurement claims. And the first of these um, uh, uh, foundations we're going to look at uh, are, are what we'll call reliable perceptual foundations, and I'll define those uh, in a second. But we'll proceed as follows. First, I want to raise a certain puzzle uh, for coherentists about measurement, which I'll call the problem of early measurement. Then what I'll do is I'll show you, uh, suggest that uh, reliable perceptual foundations provide uh, a nice solution to this problem. Uh, and then I'll walk you through an example involving uh, social behavior in mice to show you how uh, this actually works in practice. And finally, what I'll do is I'll um, show you that um, a lot of the, the anxieties uh, that, that um, the measurement coherentists sometimes express about foundationalism are based on what I would consider to be a relatively outmoded notion of foundationalism. And I think there's good uh, history of philosophy of science reasons for that. Um, but if we have a more panoptic view where you start talking to folks like Sandy Goldberg, you realize that there's actually a, a richer inventory of foundationalist concepts uh, that we can recruit here and we shouldn't engage in pearl clutching because we think that um, this is some retrograde uh, kind of activity when we appeal to foundations. Right? So uh, that's the plan of attack for this section. Uh, so recall, this is sort of where we were at with the early measurement problem. And I should say that um, uh, uh, coherentists about measurement sometimes talk about this process as a more diachronic process and sometimes as a more synchronic process. So uh, Hasek would be a good example of someone who thinks of this diachronically where that process of measurement n minus one is in fact um, uh, the product of an earlier uh, bit of coherentist based reasoning. He calls this, uh, this iterative, he calls this process epistemic iteration where we're making progress when we go from uh, uh, the, the earlier processes of measurement to the newer processes of measurement. This is often uh, a process uh, that involves succession of one measurement process to the other. Um, uh, now, I think there's a natural question that arises once you start thinking about this diachronically, which is uh, if we grant that, uh, that uh, one of our, our elements in our coherentist web is the product of an earlier uh, iteration, right? then the natural question arises, what exactly happens at the earliest stages uh, of measurement? Now you can think of this, I think, either as a philosophical question or as uh, a, an historical question to some degree. Um, but hopefully we're sort of integrating these things as, uh, as philosophers. Um, but I wanna suggest that if you're a coherentist, this looks entirely arbitrary, that there's just so many different webs that you could start off with, um, that this kind of looks like um, scientists who are sort of curious about measuring something for the first time are sort of like uh, making some Kierkegaardian leap of faith or something ridiculous like that. And I don't actually think this is how uh, practice works, how scientific practice works. Rather, I wanna suggest that reliable perceptual foundations are frequently, uh, though not necessarily always, right, the starting point for early measurement. So what do I mean by reliable perceptual foundations? Basically, there are going to be things that we call basic statements, which are justified at least in part because they are the result uh, of a reliable perceptual process such as vision, right? And Hasek's work itself suggests something along these lines. Uh, if you look at inventing temperature, um, the earliest measurement of temperature basically involves people touching things and realizing that one thing is warmer than another, right? Uh, epistemic iteration, iteration takes you through the thermoscope and ultimately through the th to the thermometer, right? But the earliest measurements just involve uh, unaided human perception, in that case, tactile perception, but obviously uh, visual perception will be another way to go. So what do I mean when I say that a statement is basic um, or foundational? I mean, uh, very roughly what I have in mind uh, is a, a denial of coherentism being the only game in town, right? That basically there are some basic or foundational statements which are justified once again, at least in part uh, by something uh, independent of their inferential and explanatory relations to other statements within a given scientific corpus. So this is just uh, to deny that uh, everything is justified via coherence, right? Foundationalists typically add on to that, that there are non-basic statements that are justified, at least in part, via uh, inference and explanation from uh, basic statements, or explanation of basic statements, perhaps. Uh, so 
Uh, one thing I want to hammer home is that when we talk about basic statements, we don't have in mind that these are self-justifying statements in the classical way that uh, this, this is often taught. Right. So when I say that they're self-justifying, it's not that there's some intrinsic property of the content of that basic statement or perhaps the beliefs about that basic statement um, that uh, vouches for its justification. Right? It's simply the denial of uh, coherence is the only game in town. Right? So we're not talking about cogito ergo sum. We're not saying it seems red to me uh, right now. Uh, those aren't the kinds of statements we have in mind. Right? So why is this foundationalism? Um, here's maybe a better way to think about it. Right. Um, uh, here's a basic uh, bit of perception. We have a guy looking at a, a butterfly and he forms the belief right, that the butterfly's wings are yellow. Right? What's happening in this particular case? Well, there's a causal process. Right? We're, we're critters in the world and we're uh, pretty good at detecting medium-sized dry goods uh, and some of their properties. Right? Uh, and the reliability of that process uh, is basically what vouches uh, for at least part of the justification of that basic belief. That's the idea. Now, crucially, right, um, the reliable perceptual process is not itself a statement, right? It, it's a process, right? It's, it's a causal transaction between us and our physical environment. Uh, so it's not the kind of thing uh, that's a candidate for coherence, uh, at least as we've defined it, or, or as a, a, any other coherentists I know really define it. Uh, and that's going to be why we have a basic belief here, because it's something other than a, a, another statement or belief uh, within a corpus that's actually doing the justifying here, right? Uh, so that's the general idea behind it. Right, that the basic belief neither explains nor is the conclusion of the reliable perceptual process. It's a product of that process. Okay, so let's look at uh, an actual case of early measurement uh, involving social behaviors in rodents. And I'll take as my starting point, Macintosh and Grant's uh, pioneering uh, work in 63, um, where essentially what they do is they uh, compare the social behaviors of uh, mice, which will be our chief focus, rats, uh, guinea pigs, and hamsters. And the way that they do this is they basically um, uh, have certain ways of, of basically putting uh, uh, pairs of mice uh, uh, and other rodents uh, in cages, right? There's certain protocols behind that, which we'll get into in a second. Two observers are basically watching the mice uh, at the same time. Their reports uh, are tape recorded, by which I think they mean that they're audio tape recorded in 63, right? Um, these are only male, male interactions in this particular study. Um, uh, obviously later uh, and even contemporaneously, they're looking at male-female interactions and female-female interactions as well. They did take photographs. I haven't been able to find any. Uh, so what they put in actual, the actual publication are drawings such as these. And let's focus on the one marked seven uh, on this particular case. This is what's called an attack. And you can see what it actually looks like. This is a picture from a later study. Uh, and this is one of many uh, aggressive behaviors that they catalog. They also uh, uh, describe threats, thrusts, chases, uh, amongst others. They describe grooming behavior, mounting behavior, uh, and other kinds of, uh, of social behaviors as well. I think they end up with about 40, if I remember correctly, in the study. And what they do in each of these cases is they try to give relatively precise protocols by which you classify a particular mouse behavior as an attack versus a threat versus a thrust versus a chase, etc. cetera. Uh, so with attack, basically, uh, this is what they um, come up with. They say that uh, one a mouse attacks another one, right? When there's a rapid approach uh, from the attacker toward the back of the attackee or the victim, right? The attacker's head then comes in contact with the other mouse's flank, right? Uh, and the attacker bites the, the victim, right? And at that point you have an attack, right? Now, what I submit is all the stuff in blue is basically justified just because these observers are thought to be able to see this stuff rather quickly. I mean, even looking at this picture, you can, um, uh, with unaided perception, basically see that one mouse is biting another mouse. And this seems to be the rationale behind what's going on here, right? So the blue stuff is going to be basic beliefs, right? Um, or basic statements. Uh, the red, that one mouse is attacking another is a non-basic statement. Crucially for the early measurement problem, right? I don't think there's any real model, uh, except in a, a rather extended <laughs> sense of that word, of how people see one mouse biting in each other, for example, right? Uh, it just seems that they're just saying, trust your, trust your eyes and there's not much more to it than that, which uh, I think fits nicely with the early measurement problem. Uh, with a solution to the early me measurement problem. Uh, so uh, I'll say a little bit more about how they end up uh, basically refining uh, uh, the, the measurement of different kinds of behaviors as a result. Right? So um, this is one of the ways in which they, they basically do this, the resident intruder paradigm, where one mouse is basically at home in a particular cage. That one's called the resident. Uh, for 15 to 30 minutes, they introduce an intruder who is not at home in that cage, and they monitor the behaviors and take take, uh, uh, monitor, uh, they record whether there's an attack or a chase or a threat. 
And what they can then do is me measure aggression, for instance, by the frequency and duration of the set of aggressive behaviors that are going on. And obviously they can do this with uh, other sorts of behaviors that are non-aggressive, right? So grooming and um, close inspection and things like that. Uh, so uh, with that, we can, I, I now wanna turn to uh, maybe something that's, that's irking some of you, uh, Khalifa, why are you being a foundationalist, right? I thought we were done with that stuff, right? Uh, and what I wanna suggest is um, uh, we as philosophers of science have perhaps lagged a, a little far behind in terms of understanding what foundationalism can be, right? We haven't sort of mastered the possibilities if I can put it that way. Uh, and this is particularly um, uh, striking in the epistemology of measurement where a lot of the paradigmatic foundationalists uh, are espousing positions that are 50 or 60 years old, like Bridgman, for instance. Uh, and there's some interesting developments in epistemology that I think we can import over here. And most of it involves shedding certain baggage that we might associate with foundationalism. Right? So the first of these is uh, the association of foundationalism with infallibilism, right? The idea that uh, a, a foundational statement uh, has to be true. Uh, and that's not really part of our story, right? Uh, basic statements can be fallible, right? A basic statement can be justified yet nevertheless false. Right? And I think this is easy to see when we uh, look at Macintosh and Grant's um, uh, example, right? So uh, we'll see a video of, of two mice attacking each other in a little bit, and you'll see that it moves really quickly. Uh, and uh, so the, the possibility of error seems, uh, seems likely. And of course, we all know from our own personal experiences that sometimes we gain information, right? Uh, as a result of, of, uh, of uh, visual perception, and um, it ends up being incorrect. Uh, same thing can happen here, and it's uh, in some ways more likely to happen just given how quickly the mice move. Um, so you might think that you see a mouse biting another one, but maybe you know it doesn't happen, right? Maybe it's a, a glancing uh, kind of uh, nuzzle or, or whatever it would be the equivalent of a glancing blow when, when you're engaging in a bite. I'm not quite sure what the word is there. Uh, at any rate, uh, you could be justified in believing that you saw uh, uh, a mouse biting another mouse, right? But that belief could be false. Uh, and uh, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't undercut the justification, it would just undercut the truth. Uh, you you, get, you uh, gain that information through a reliable process, so there's no reason to deny you justification. And we often uh, do this in, in everyday life as well. Uh, someone sees some, thinks they see something and uh, that ends up being exculpatory, for instance, uh, in terms of the, the beliefs that ensue. Uh, another common misconception is that basic beliefs uh, are indefeasible, right? That basically uh, their justificatory status cannot be affected by new information. So this isn't going to be a, an example of a basic statement. This is going to be a defeasible inference, but it's the paradigmatic example just to motivate what defeasibility is, right? Suppose that I know that Tweety is a bird. Uh, and from this, I, I, I can reasonably infer that Tweety can fly, but then new information comes in. It turns out that, that Tweety's a penguin, right? Obviously the inference gets defeated as a result. My justification for saying that Tweety can fly is no longer, uh, no longer holds, right? And we can have the same thing here, right? Um, uh, and this is very much of a piece with contemporary epistemology that basically um, basic statements uh, need only be prima facie justified and they can be re rendered unjustified or defeated in the face of new information. Um, and I think we can see that example once again when we think about Macintosh and Grant's um, behavioral protocols. Right? Uh, and in particular, what's exciting about this is you can start to see how the mosaic conception um, uh, takes a little bit more shape because it can be incoherence right, that defeats basic statements justification. Uh, so recall that there are two observers uh, in any particular case uh, when uh, we're trying to uh, 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 monitor or observe uh, mouse behavior. Right? Uh, what happens in those particular cases is uh, you might have one observer claim that, uh, the, that the mouse A bit mouse B and the second observer saying, oh no, that didn't happen, right? So obviously you're gonna have incoherence in your corpus, right? Uh, and that's going to be reason, you know, obviously there's a fact of the matter as to whether the mouse bit the other mouse. So it's not that the, the claim becomes true or false. It's just, it's no longer justified um, uh, from the lights of, uh, of the, the observer who thought that there was a bite. Uh, so that's a very simple example of that. And obviously they can get much more sophisticated, but uh, I just wanna sort of show you that, um, that there's nothing about, uh, about fallibilism, uh, sorry, about found foundationalism that's, uh, that it's so rigid in this regard and that there's plenty of room for crosstalk between coherence and foundationalism. Uh, sort of the flip side of that is just as incoherence can defeat um, basic statements justifications, uh, coherence can ameliorate basic statements justification. Uh, and this is sort of a fun example, right? So um, 
Uh, already with Macintosh and Grant, they recognized that there were threats that were distinct from attacks. But one thing they discovered subsequently is sometimes there's not a rapid uh, approach before uh, uh, one mice, mouse bites another. And also sometimes there's a rapid approach, right? Um, but there's no bite that ensues. So they ended up peeling apart or, or distinguishing these two behaviors, uh, attack and sideways threat. They're both aggressive behaviors, but only one counts as an attack. And frequently they talk about this in terms of an attack bite. And one of the nice early studies that sort of uh, recruited this information is Meechek and O'Donnell. And this is, uh, every time I, I think about this study, I kind of laugh. So basically the premise of this is, is to give mice your favorite party drugs like cocaine and methamphetamines and stuff like that. Uh, and what they noticed, this is once again, a resident intruder paradigm that like coked out residents, right, are more likely to engage in sideways threats without attacks, but um, uh, intruders who are, who are uh, taking meth, right, are more likely to engage in attacks, but not sideways threats. That's caricaturing a bit what's going on, but it's a fun way of sort of telling the story, All right? So now let's think about that in terms of amelioration, right? Uh, so you get uh, some initial justification uh, uh, because uh, you just see, right, the mouse rapidly approaching or the mouse biting or what have you, right? Uh, but then you get further justification because that coheres nicely with uh, the various hypotheses uh, about the resident intruder models interactions with uh, different drug treatments uh, uh, in terms of behavior. Right? And so you get a more cohesive web and that boosts the justification even of uh, these uh, basic statements in blue as the general idea. Uh, so, with, uh, and then the final point to make is, uh, as we're thinking about foundationalism, and I, I think this is sort of evident from what we've already said about defeasibility and ameliorability, right, is that foundationalism is not reductive, right? So the standard picture is you have these non-basic statements, right, and all of their epistemic juice basically bottoms out in the epistemic juice of the, um, of the basic statements. And uh, uh, what should be clear from our view is that non-basic statements uh, uh, have justification both from their inferential links to basic statements and their coherence uh, with other statements. Uh, so there's not going to be any kind of reductive program in what we're doing. Right? And crucially, what I wanna hammer home with all of this is, is just the, the happy coexistence of foundationalism and coherentism, the, the mosaic conception that we're trying to push. And what I wanna do is, uh, so reliable perceptual foundations are sort of unexceptional uh, in um, contemporary epistemology. Functional foundations are sort of our, our own baby. They're, they're, they're um, something that we came up with uh, in thinking through some of these examples. Um, and uh, these are, these are uh, slightly more unorthodox. Uh, so we'll be really interested to see what you say about these. So, the core idea behind these is these are taken for granted assumptions, right, which are justified in virtue of the way that the scientific community divides its labor. That's the rough idea, and we'll try to unpack that a bit more. And we think that these are especially important um, simply because uh, they seem to, to be a really dominant uh, mode of justification um, in measurement, and we think probably in science more broadly, though uh, we obviously aren't going to entertain that broader thesis uh, today. Right, so if we sort of take stock of where we're at, um, we basically know that there are going to be some central metrological claims that are justified via coherence. That's the modest measurement coherentism, right? Um, and at least some edges of the web, if we want to use that sort of uh, uh, language, right, are at least in the cases of early measurement going to be justified via reliable perceptual foundations. Uh, we now want to suggest that there's another kind of foundation, functional foundationalism uh, foundations, which do even further work uh, that we can see here, right? Uh, and once again, the idea is when you start thinking about scientific practice, it's sort of striking uh, how much information gets taken for granted. And that's what we're basically thinking of as a functional foundation. Um, the, the animating idea behind this, which I think will become clear in a few slides, is that one scientist's basic statement is another scientist's non-basic statement. Um, and as I said, this is once again keyed right, to the vast division of, of labor that we see uh, in the scientific community. So here's the rough setup for it. Right. You need to have at least two scientific subcommunities. One we'll call the reliant community and one we'll call the outsourced community. I should also say that the relations between these and who's outsourcing whom and when uh, is actually very interesting, though it's not something we'll talk about very much today. Uh, so you have these two communities and let's just assume that the reliant community by definition is the one that has the functional foundation. Uh, we'll focus uh, on uh, you know, the paradigmatic uh, P. Uh, so the thought is, uh, obviously, this can't just be some arbitrary assumption they're making. There has to be something that, that vouches right, um, for the justification of this functional foundation. And that's going to be a social dependency that they have on the outsourced community, right? Uh, where basically they're saying, hey, we don't have any, uh, we can just take this for granted because this outsourced community uh, has um, 
additional grounds for accepting it, right? So the idea is going to be that P is a functional foundation in a reliant community, just in case P is at least partially justified uh, independently of its explanatory and inferential relations to other statements widely accepted in the reliant community's corpus, right? That's what makes it a, a foundation uh, consistent with some of the other things that we've said. Uh, and furthermore, its, justific its justificational status, right? And the reliant community reflects uh, the reliant community's dependence uh, on the other outsourced community that does have um, uh, explicit reasons it can provide for this. Okay. And so what I'm gonna do now is um, uh, basically walk you through uh, a sequel to thinking about um, mouse behavior and we'll focus uh, once again on attacks. Uh, I guess I'm just feeling, uh, I don't know, uh, pugilistic or something. Uh, and we'll be looking at Hong and his collaborators um, automated assessment of social behaviors in mice. Uh, this includes a attack as I noted uh, also includes close um, inspection, uh, close examination, and, uh, and mounting. Right? Um, and uh, the insights of this is how it combined video tracking, depth sensing, and machine learning all together. So we're going to talk you through some of the stages of that. So um, first thing to note is the design of the cage and the placement of the cameras and the depth sensors. Uh, you can see that the, the, the cage is sort of uh, uh, nestled in this, um, this prism right? um, used to block out some of the light. Uh, and the top camera and the depth sensor are there. And then the, uh, the side camera obviously is on the side. Right? And it took them some work to figure out the appropriate depth sensor, but we don't need to worry about that for today. They get uh, video feeds from these uh, various um, cameras and sensors, right? And they need to basically coordinate all that to form a 3D map of the cage. They do this using a program in MATLAB. Um, those, um, the red and blue thing that you see sort of near the X axis there, uh, those are basically representations of mouse according to this program, mice according to this program. So you've got a blue mouse and a, a red mouse, uh, just so you have a sense of what's going on. Once again, they use the resident intruder paradigm. Right? Um, what's different in this case is that they um, vary both the residents and the intruders uh, by, by sex. So there are both male and female uh, intruders um, in the various runs that they do. Uh, everything else is basically the same, right? The intruders interact with the residents for 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, next step, right, is they use the video uh, data, uh, uh, so just the camera data, uh, no, no depth sensor stuff in this so far as I can tell. Um, uh, and, and they had some uh, algorithms to basically track the mice's poses and movements, right? And this basically serves uh, as um, uh, part of the uh, machine learning uh, algorithm, right, where what they're basically going to do now is classify these three social behaviors, attack, uh, close examination, and mounting. Um, uh, and it starts off with a uh, supervised learning, right? The ground truth data set is actually not that different than what Macintosh and Grant were after. It's two humans looking at video data and basically classifying the different behaviors. Uh, so that's the, un that's the supervised learning part. But of course the training wheels come off and then we see something that looks very much like what the coherentist of measurement uh, emphasize. And um, I I'm just gonna go over this quickly because I don't feel like uh, I have much new to say to this. It's mostly to show you how it, uh, it's nested within a, a, a more, um, a, 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 other kinds of epistemological structures, right? And so what you see here is basically that um, they're doing quite well with the standard kinds of, uh, of, of virtues that we talk about with measurement, things like precision and accuracy. Uh, just so you know, on the bottom, TP stands for true positive, FP stands for false positive, and then N stands for negative. Um, uh, so, so much of this is just doing exactly what the coherentist of measurements uh, uh, want you to do. We have our two processes of measurement, right? The uh, human annotators or observers, and the machine learning algorithm. And we're seeing that these things cohere nicely. But of course, uh, Hong uh, and uh, company basically wanna point out that you're enhancing coherence and they do this in basically two different ways. Um, one is sort of more of a promissory note where they just say, uh, look, we know that humans have certain kinds of limitations uh, and machine learning uh, algorithms look like they're going to be able to overcome some of these limitations. So uh, amongst the things they mention are fatigue and flagging attention, right? Um, missing events that are either too quick or too slow, and obviously the problem of inter-rater reliability uh, as some of the problems that get overcome. So wherever these things are, are hurdles uh, to human observers, right, the algorithm is going to uh, enhance our coherence. Uh, but they also do something else that's really neat. Um, they they, they uh, have two use cases where basically what they do is they take um, uh, uh, previously established hypotheses and basically show that the machine learning algorithm uh, uh, coheres with those hypotheses. And I'll sort of briefly talk you through these. And so there's a prior finding that basically um, the mouse on the left, what's called the New Zealand black mouse, uh, is more aggressive than the mouse on the right, uh, what's sometimes called the black 6N. Right? 
And in uh, different trials, uh, Hong et al. Uh, basically used each of these as a resident mouse and exposed them to an albino mouse, a Balb C. Right? And uh, as predicted, right, the, uh, based on the machine learning algorithm, right, the New Zealand black mice spent more time attacking uh, the, albino, the, the albino intruders and less time engaging in non-aggressive behaviors such as close investigation. Right? And they also attacked with greater frequency uh, than you found with the black six Ns. Right? So this coheres with a, a previous hypothesis. Uh, they did a second use case right, involving uh, the black and tan brachiary. Right? Uh, this one is known to display more autism-like uh, behavioral phenotypes, such as reduced social interactions than the black six ends. Once again, this is a, a previous uh, result. Uh, and once again, they're sort of using this as a way of advertising the coherence uh, of uh, the machine learning algorithm. Uh, very similar sort of setup, right? The two strains, strains are treated as residents and exposed to the albino. Uh, and black and tans, uh, as predicted, spend less time investigating intruders than black six Ns and do so with less frequency. And it's the machine learning algorithm, which is basically um, uh, generating that dat data. So now let's sort of think about um, uh, what this looks like when we, we start to consider um, more broadly um, where everything is getting its justification from, right? And uh, the, the two resources we have, uh, if we sort of bracket functional foundations for now, uh, is just what we get from modest measurement coherentism, which is just coherence, and then reliable perceptual uh, um, uh, processes or reliable perceptual foundations. Uh, and I think these two sorts of claims, certainly uh, that the machine learning measures uh, are, are largely justified via coherence, right? Uh, and uh, obviously the human observation just is a kind of perception. And right? uh, so we can see how those fit into the framework we have so far. But what I wanna show you is actually a majority of those supporting claims that we mentioned before, um, the things that the, the, the guy in light blue is basically cohering with, right, are themselves um, justified not by the coherence within this particular web, but by other sorts of things. And I think these are all going to be ripe candidates uh, for um, functional, for being functional foundations, right? Uh, so uh, I'll go through them uh, 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 in turn, right? Um, so one of the things they have to assume, uh, a nice auxiliary hypothesis, is that the cameras are reliable, right? Now, obviously, uh, uh, that's not a perceptual process, at least in the narrow sense of unaided human perception. And the reliability of the camera depends at least partly on its ability to detect what's happening in these mouse cages, but most of its reliability, right, and most of it, that justification for the reliability is happening outside of what's happening in this particular um, set, uh, study, right? Uh, I think this gets even more striking when we think about the use of MATLAB, right? Um, MATLAB is not dependent on the antics of mice, right? It's dependent on broad computational and mathematical considerations, and that's what's justifying most of what's going on in that, um, that computer program, right? Uh, uh, they also, this one's a, a, a slightly more complicated case. Uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't create all of their own pose uh, tracking algorithms. They borrowed these from other studies, but it turns out that some of these other studies uh, were uh, the, some of the co-authors uh, of, of Hong were involved in those as well. So you might think that this actually does uh, fit within a larger sort of coherentist story. Okay. Um, their choice of machine learning algorithm, TreeBagger, this is part of a random decision uh, tree kind of uh, algorithm. Uh, obviously, once again, this is not the kind of thing that's justified in virtue of its one-off performance uh, and making sense of uh, mouse social behaviors, right? There's statistical and computational kinds of justifications that are lurking in the background, right? And crucially, when I mention these other justifications, note that um, the grasp of these things by uh, Hong uh, and, and uh, associates might be somewhat limited, right? Uh, uh, then let's get into the, the, the mousier kinds of claims which you might think cohere more. And I think there is uh, a stronger case to be made for coherence in certain cases, but this wouldn't be one of them, right? That the mice are representative uh, of their respective strains. So for instance, that you, uh, you have a representative uh, instance of uh, a black 6N or a New Zealand black mouse or a black and tan brachiary, right? Um, uh, that one we'll talk about at length. I'm gonna use that as my sort of test case for a functional foundation, right? Um, I think these are probably the ones that gain the most via coherence uh, with the machine learning algorithm, which are basically these hypotheses um, that were corroborated uh, independently through the machine learning algorithm. But uh, I think all of these are plausible, but, but note once again, even with those, which probably enjoy the most coherence, right? If things had gone otherwise, uh, probably that would have been an indictment more on the machine learning algorithm than on the prior studies, right? Uh, uh, without further testing, at least. Uh, now, um, I wanna focus on this guy because it's an interesting one. You might think, oh, oh this is a pretty innocuous auxiliary hypothesis and all of this. Um, uh, but I wanna suggest that it's actually a, a nice example of uh, a functional foundation, 
right, that the mice are representative of their resp respective strains. Uh, and all you have to do is, is open up the hood a little bit to get a sense of how this works. And so um, they get these mice from the Jackson lab, which is uh, one of the key providers uh, of different mouse strains. Right? And I wanna suggest that this uh, nicely illustrates how epistemic outsourcing works. Uh, and one way to do this is to start to look at the Jackson Labs uh, uh, web, as it were. Uh, and in particular, you might look uh, at um, the manual that they give to people who already have uh, colonies of mice and the advice that they give them, which is very useful advice. I feel like I, I, I now have uh, know a little bit more about how to maintain colonies of mice having read this. Um, uh, but you no, know, even here, they're sort of crying out for a little bit of epistemic outsourcing. They say, if you want to ensure the genetic integrity uh, of your strains uh, and prevent genetic drift, obtain your mice from a reliable source. And guess who they think is a reliable source, right? The Jackson lab. Uh, and so they spend a, a good deal of time discussing how they maintain genetic integrity uh, and their strains. And you can see it's a pretty sophisticated process, right? They have a foundation stock, which they will exogenously expand where they can, but then there's this uh, elaborate uh, embryonic freezing protocol um, and they cycle through the stock uh, in a way uh, to reestablish the foundation about every five generations. And now I'm gonna suggest, um, uh, all of that is in the Jackson Labs uh, corpus uh, of, of scientific statements, uh, but probably very little of that is in the, 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 the corpus of, uh, of Hong and, and the collaborators, uh, chiefly because they're like computer scientists and people focused on animal behavior. They're not focusing on, on mouse husbandry. Uh, and, um, and so that puts us then in a position to see how this is going to work, that basically they just get to say, well, we think these are representative mice just because they come from the Jackson lab. And then if you wanna sort of find out further justification, you have to go ask the, the Jackson lab is the thought. Uh, now, I, I suspect at this point, there might be a concern, right? Which is, um, look, there's just one web basically between these two, uh, these two uh, groups of inquirers, right? And this taken for grantedness, which you're using as a symptom for functional foundations is merely pragmatic, but it's not epistemic, right? Uh, now, the first thing I wanna say about this is of course, uh, we need to then be very clear about what we mean by pragmatic and epistemic. I suspect that there's many people in the audience who feel like that's not a sustainable distinction. Um, and at, at the very least, I'd like to know exactly what people have in mind by that. But the other thing I wanna point out is that it's quite implausible that there's uh, a single uh, web of accepted statements between the Jackson Lab on the one hand and Hung and, uh, and uh, company on the other. They have really different specializations. Uh, and so that would be rather striking. Um, uh, and furthermore, it looks like things like deferrals, uh, uh, epistemic deferrals of some sort or another are genuine ways of, of justifying claims in scientific practice. So I think that there's even a setup to the suspicion that's a little fishy, but um, let's forge ahead anyway and sort of say like, look, this thing walks and talks like a foundation, right? Uh, one way you might motivate this very quickly is that when we think of functional foundations, right? They're the kinds of things that can serve as regress stoppers when people ask you for further justification, right? And so the thought is, um, pretty quickly when you ask the inquirers about, that is Hung and, and company, uh, what they think about, um, why they think they have a, a representative instance of, let's say, a black 6N, what they're going to say is, well, because we got it from the Jackson lab, and it's not going to go any further than that. Um, of course, you can keep on going, but then you're not asking them anymore. Uh, and if we think about the analog uh, in the individual case, it's pretty clear that that, would, um, uh, that wouldn't undercut the, the, the regress stopper function uh, for the individual uh, who, who defers to another individual. Um, it's still functioning as a foundation for the deferring individual, um, even if it doesn't stop the regress for the deferred individual is the, is the rough idea. Um, I think we can also draw an, an analogy um, with what we said about reliable perceptual processes and foundations, right? There you remember the reason why we said that this, uh, this functions as a foundation, or this is a foundation, is because we have a process and not a statement um, that's sort of doing the justificatory work, and hence there can't be an explanatory or inferential relationship between a process uh, and, the, and the basic statement. Um, that's just sort of a category mistake. And I think you can run a very similar sort of story here, right? Um, so just like we're critters who can um, uh, reliably detect uh, medium-sized uh, dry goods, we're also critters who in certain social environments can navigate that uh, quite competently as well. Um, and it's that social process rather than uh, a perceptual process in the other case, which is doing some of the justificatory work. Right? You say, fine, but that's not where my concern is. My concern is the fact that there's justification in the outsource community. And so this is just coherence at a, a, a coarser grain or a, a, a wider lens, if you like. And I think what I want to point out there is um, the same thing I said before, right? Like um, the fact that, that someone else has reasons for uh, a certain kind of claim doesn't mean that those are my reasons for the claim uh, immediately. 
Um, this is not actually part of the, the reliant community's beliefs, and hence you can't say that it's a statement within the corpus. And so all I basically need is some way of individuating corpuses, and it looks like uh, uh, this sort of suggests itself simply by the fact that we don't think that um, the same set of claims that are acceptable to the Jackson Lab are going to be acceptable to the researchers. Uh, so hopefully that uh, that uh, assuages any fears that this isn't really foundationalism, and of course the really there is is, is a, a complicated story as well as we as we've already seen. So just wrapping up, uh, I think there's basically four take home lessons I want you to get from this. Uh, the first is that only modest measurement coherentism is supported by that circle of measurement argument, right? That paves the way for a mosaic account of metrological justification in which coherence and foundationalism uh, get to sort of work in tandem with each other. And we saw two places where this might occur. The first of which is uh, reliable perceptual foundations, which seem to do a nice job of making sense of uh, the epistemology of early measurement. Uh, and the second were uh, functional foundations, which seem to be damn near everywhere. And we want to point out that these are not restricted even to, to measurement. And so with that, uh, I want to thank, uh, obviously, all the folks at the center, um, Shaheen and Edouard and Alex. Uh, I also want to thank my co-author, Sandy Goldberg. Uh, and finally, I want to thank my students in my winter term course in the philosophy of science uh, for uh, being a, a very captive audience and instructive uh, in the feedback they gave me as I was working through these ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shaheen, for this great, great talk. Uh, uh, Karen, for this great talk. You see, you're misleading me. All right. Uh, sorry about that. End of the semester. Uh, so let me remind you how that's going to be uh, working. If you have a question for Karin, please go to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A button and just write your name. And I will promote you to the status of panelists. And then you can ask your question directly. It's going to take me one or two minutes to do that. Meanwhile, I will promote Sandy Goldberg, so that's going to be the, uh, 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 a co-panelist with Karin. Karin, could you get out of the, uh, the uh, uh, screen sharing? Of course, yes, yeah, absolutely. All right. Hey, Sandy, how are you? Good to see you. Sam. Dana, you're the first, go ahead. Hi. Uh, sorry, you said I'm, I'm first, right, Edward? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah, great talk. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this stuff. I just had one question um, about the way that you portrayed epistemic iteration mm -hmm. uh, in this in this talk, and I wonder if uh, th there seemed to be an aspect of it that was left out of the picture here, and I wonder if when that's incorporated, if that uh, creates any issues, uh, yeah, for the ideas you presented here. And that aspect, which Chang talks about is, is this uh, possibility that a later form of measurement, uh, which, which you take the empirical success of which to be based on sort of a prior, uh, mm -hmm. A prior measurement, yeah, like a, like a, a later model is based on the empirical success of a prior, uh, yeah, or it's, its empirical success is based on a prior form of measurement, yeah, and you, sit, you say iteration kind of gets up and running in this way, uh, but Chang points out that uh, later measurement techniques may actually undermine the reliability of prior techniques. For example, the thermoscope shows that just touching things is actually an unreliable way of getting an accurate understanding of its temperature. Um, and so that sort of cuts off the foundation in, in a sense. And I, maybe, maybe this only happens in the very like earliest developments of, of uh, forms of measurement, but I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. There are all sorts of ways that uh, perceptual processes have been found to be unreliable. Um, and so, yeah, you know, and once a better theoretical understanding of a particular means of measurement is developed, we might realize, oh, all along, this was actually not a good way of looking at this or that phenomenon. Um, so yeah, yeah, this question of like, yeah, later, later measurements undermining earlier methods, is that a problem for, for your claim of um, that there's sort of a reliable process at the, at the bottom? Uh, okay, yeah, thanks. Um... I was hoping the stuff about defeasibility uh, and ameliorability would, would address some of those issues. Um, and I think maybe it's because I focused, I, I think if I'm understanding um, the, the, the force of your question, it's um, 
there's the outputs of the process, right, which are going to be justified on that view. And that's what I focused on being undercut. But you're saying, well, what about reliability claims themselves? Can those be undercut? And I think absolutely those could be as well. Um, uh, there's no reason that that wouldn't happen. And I think that's that's the norm. Often what happens, so, so I think uh, you even see this with the, the example I gave you towards the end, uh, where what they're basically saying is like, this thing is going to, right, the um, human observation is reliable within a given range, right? But there's certain cases where we know that that's going to break down. Uh, and so what they're basically showing you is this is why there's greater coherence and you can, so, so even reliability claims are defeasible, maybe it's the quick, quick version of your answer. Um, but thank you. Thanks. Sandy, feel free to jump in whenever you want. Uh, Daniel. Hi. <clears throat> hey, um, that was phenomenal as always. Um, this is more of a question about the dialectic than anything substantive, I think. So you start off saying, well, coherentism by itself isn't enough. And if I understood correctly, and then in the end, you say, well, coherentism and reliability by itself might, isn't enough. We need something like functional foundationalism. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of wondering, why did you go through section three about reliable processes at all? So for those few of us maybe who are still suspicious of reliabilism as a source of justification, um, it seemed like you didn't need that, did you? Or do you just, um, since it wasn't going to be enough anyway, did you need to sort of, it seemed like you were briefly committed to reliabilism of ju justification to some extent, and I don't know you have to be, and I don't know you want to be. Uh, um, I, I may punt this to, to, to Sandy Goldberg in a second. Um, uh, I guess my thought was just, these are actually just independent job descriptions that each of these foundations are doing. Uh, so when we talk about early measurement, it does look like uh, that's going to be a broadly reliable view. And that's like one question you might have, yeah. right? But I agree with you that as you move further and further, as, as your measurement procedures become more and more sophisticated, you're less likely to rely on reliable perceptual foundation. Is that sort of the, uh, the thought that... I, I guess I was mostly just wondering what sort of... I mean, so it didn't appear in your concluding slide. Any... Oh, the... Did it? The... I said the... re reliable perceptual foundations are useful for making sense of early measurement or something. Oh, okay. Like that. Uh, yeah. I missed that. Okay. Um... Yeah. I'm, so, so maybe maybe this helps in terms of the dialectic. I think there's a, a, a an interesting puzzle about early measurement. You might not agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for that purposes, I think reliable measurement, uh, reliable perceptual foundations, is an interesting tool for making sense of what's going on. Um, uh, I, I, where I agree with you that it's not enough is, is once the the enterprise starts get rolling, it starts to get rolling that 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 that, that quickly erodes. So. Um, you see the same thing with thermometry, right? We start touching stuff um, and that's, uh, you know, you couldn't do that now. <laughs> like if you wanted to measure like, you know, the thermodynamics of nanofluids or something like that, that's not going to do you any good. Uh, and I take it it's sort of the, the, the same kind of thing uh, that might eventually, but, you know, even 50 years later, uh, note that people are still using human observation uh, uh, with animal behavior, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. No, that's great. I think I, I, I have a better sense of the flow of the argument now. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Sandy Goldberg, did you, sorry, you're, you're, you're going to have to have a last name as long as Sandy Mitchell is in the room. Uh, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think your, your point was exactly right. Although I, I would say, um, I just want to point out there's a difference between it's saying that reliability and reliable perception isn't enough and saying it's not even needed. Right. Um, that, that's the distinction I think Kareem was just pointing to. And that's, so I'm just reiterating. Yeah. Okay. Good. So you just, okay. I'm good. Thank you. Sandy, go fight. Hi. Hi, Sandy. Hey. Good to see you. And it's good to see you. Kareem. Good to see you as well, Sandy. <laughs> I thought this was great. I'm really interested in these issues. And um, I just had one question, maybe a little naive question, which is what you're calling foundationalism has, um, has turned out to be a kind of local distinction. And so um, it looks like the foundation, what we, you know, the kind of functional uh, mm. account of it makes it what it, you know, this is a foundation, this acts as a foundation for me, but not maybe not for these other guys where it's the conclusion of some uh, set of inferences from some other foundation, et cetera. Yes, exactly. And I thought foundationalism was supposed to be something more global in the sense that it was something that we all appealed to, not just the reasons I have versus the reasons you have, because I'm worried about um, uh, now the, how, how, it, 
how local you want to go because then it looks like it's you know now we're into some kind of relativized you know explosion here so i was a little curious about the uh, appealing to language of foundationalists to make it just the the my foundations right um and and does that raise i mean is it really fair to call it foundationalism in that case yeah so um I hope this will make you happy, but I'm not confident it will, Sandy. Um, We definitely want to emphasize the social aspects of functional foundationalism. Uh, And uh, and I think you're right to to put your finger on that as something we need to say more about is exactly what social processes count as legitimate epistemic outsourcing. Uh, uh, Sandy Goldberg had a nice list, which I probably should have included in the talk. Uh, Let me see if I can find them really quickly. uh, so yeah, some of the things that Sandy mentioned is that you're going to need to have like some kind of quality control in terms of, of what actually gets to be outsourced and things like that. That's sort of the spirit of it. Uh, I'm not going to try and do justice to it because I think uh, Sandy Goldberg, as a social epistemologist, can probably say uh, maybe a bit more than I can about this uh, in a responsible way. But um, I, I certainly don't want it to be individualistic foundationalism. I don't know if that's going to be um, still too local for you. Um, I'd like to think of it chiefly in terms of uh, different uh, subcommunities have different tasks uh, and it's going to be largely sort of what function they're playing within a larger epistemic, uh, within a larger scientific enterprise um, that's going to put some constraints on legitimate and illegitimate forms of outsourcing. But Sandy, please, Sandy Goldberg, please go ahead. So, so Sandy, I, I, I feel the force of your worry, and I, I want to see if the following analogy moves you at all. Um, it's moved me, but I, I actually think that I'm theory driven now, so I'm no, I don't trust my own intuitions on this. In the epistemology of testimony, there is a debate that many of you will know about whether we should think of somebody say so as providing uh, um, ipso facto default justification, prima facie default justification uh, or not. And the people who think that it does, at least some of them, think that I can get a belief that P through accepting what you've told me, which for me serves as foundational, despite the fact that you yourself have better evidence for it than I do. The only evidence I have for it is your say so. And so when I was thinking about what, what Kareem, Kareem came up with the name epistemic outsourcing, when I was thinking about this, it struck me that this was in some respects the social analog of what the anti-reductionist has to say in, in the epistemology of testimony. And insofar as in the epistemology of testimony, um, anti-reductionism does count testimonial beliefs as foundational, I thought at least in the epistemology community, this is a perfectly straightforward use where it's foundational for me, despite the fact that it's epistemic goodies uh, in some sense, derive from things that you have that I don't. Okay, I'll just make a brief uh, comment. I'm not a fan. I'm an anti-foundationalist, just so that's clear. And so, but I, I'm interested in the way, the way how you get there. And I guess the social appealing to the social. Now we've moved to a different, if you like, source of uh, support. Um, and the social, I used to be more keen on the social until the, the most recent political uh, world that we live in. But nevertheless, um, I don't trust anybody anymore. Um, I, I, I'll just, put, so I, I think that's interesting and I, I will think about it further. Um, I guess one of the, just a, a, another thing you, that's interesting about what you've said is that this is also happens within scientific collaborations where you have explicit divisions of labor mm-hmm. and what it is that you have to accept. It's a little bit like testimony. It's a little bit about like outsourcing. And so that might be another location um, to yeah. run your arguments that, uh, that also might be quite informative. But thank you. Is well, thank this a you. paper and can I get it? Uh, soon, hopefully. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, but we, we would love your feedback on it. So we'll force it upon you whether you want it or not. All right, excellent. <laughs> Thanks, indeed, for joining us. Boaz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so uh, great talk. Uh, I liked uh, the, the last part, uh, really. Uh, I really like the last part. Uh, less uh, um, the, the first part. I want to defend uh, uh, Iran and uh, uh, Hasok a bit more. I think you're being uh, a bit unfair to them. So take Iran, Iran uh, um, example of uh, how the standard second is manufactured. So it would be entirely true that the International Bureau of Weights and Measures that produces the standard time is a functional foundation foundation by your accounts, because this is the stopping point for everybody who wants to know the accurate time. This is, this is entirely correct, I think. You, you got that right. But uh, if you look in deep into what this bureau is doing, 
you wouldn't find any foundation that is based on some reliable sense perception. This is a fiction that doesn't exist. Why? Because if you look at how they actually calculate the time, they do an average way of, of perfectly, several perfectly reliable atomic uh, clocks that don't tick at the same rate because each of them um, is supposed to uh, implement an idealized model. So a, a model that doesn't, can't exist in reality. So your foundation, if, if foundationalism was correct, were correct, you would assume that there would be just one reliable clock and, and, and everybody would just you know, defer to it as the arbitrator of time. But there is no such thing. There are several uh, uh, clocks and you need to weigh it, you need to do the average all the time in, and, and tweak them and interfere in them, you know, and, and change the, the weight all the time to make sure that none of them uh, hijacks the, the, the standard time from the others and that they, uh, um, and that you balance the errors, the ticking errors in each one of them. So there is no foundation here. There is just no, not, not, found, not a foundation in the sense of a reliable sense perception. There is maybe a social, functional, yeah. institutional. Yes. Can, I, can I jump in, Boaz? Yeah, um, just to be clear, uh, Iran was not one of our targets. I don't think anywhere he says anything approaching ambitious measurement coherentism. So uh, ambitious. Oh, but, but he does. I've talked with him so much. You know, I've, uh, we okay. did a, well, we in, did in print, I, I, I mean, uh, I would, I'd be interested for you to find me a passage because I've been monitoring this very closely. Uh, looking for him to say that it's it's only coherence and nothing else, but but maybe uh, you know uh, he he wants to be more explicit about this. Um, so yeah, um, but and then in terms of what you're saying, of course, we, we our, our claim about reliable perceptual foundations. Perhaps this didn't come out clearly enough given Daniel's question as well. Is that it's limited to early measurement. So I I, I don't think that looking at, uh, at at the way that we we set standards of time now is going to have a lot of reliable perceptual foundations. I agree with that thoroughly. Um, but what, what would be interesting is like looking at what happened with sundials and things like that, uh, whether there's reliable perceptual foundations there. That's the only claim we're making about reliable perceptual foundations. Um, now, the functional foundations, uh, there's going to be certain cases uh, where uh, I think it's an interesting question. And I'd have to look at the details of the case a little bit more closely. But I, I suspect that there are going to be some things that get taken for granted when you're calibrating time, other things that won't be. But of course, that's consistent with everything we say as well. Can I add just something Please. like I, I, I would just iterate uh, Dana's point uh, from before, you know, maybe if some, you know, if, if historically, you know, putting my hands into water and feeling subjectively feeling the warmth and cold, coldness of the water was a foundation historically, Hassock's point is that the process is uh, progressive. So whatever was then, it, you know, whatever the foundation was, in the early days in history, it is no longer the foundation. The foundation uh, of, of That's entirely practice, consistent with what we say. That's entirely consistent changed. with what we say. So, so what's the epistemic import of your point? Okay, so once, no, it's, it's, is it a purely historical point? Uh, well- uh, epistemic significance? <laughs> You'd have to define epistemic significance for me. I take it for people who are engaged in early measurement, it's actually quite a significant uh, uh, result, right? Like uh, just once again, if you don't want to use uh, uh, Hasek's example, use the, the the animal measurement case where they're still actually using human perception, right, to, as a as a basis of evidence, right? Um, so so it seems to me that just uh, yes, there are. This is consistent with everything we've said that there are going to be examples where there are no reliable perceptual foundations doing any heavy lifting. Right? But there are that's that's perfectly consistent with there being examples where there are where, where it is doing some heavy lifting. And if I, if I could just yeah, jump so in good. here, if I could just jump in here, I may I may have a stronger view than than Kareem. So I don't mm -hmm. I don't pretend to speak for Kareem here. Um, but Boaz, I'm a little surprised that when when you tried to to criticize the foundational aspect of it, the the point you made was that there's no single reliable clock. But of course, our foundationalism isn't a foundationalism about the reliability of instruments. We're trying to account for the reliability of instruments. And our, the thought of reliable perceptual uh, processes is precisely that insofar as human perception is used at all, um, it's it, that is giving us a foundational element. And that may even give us a foundational element in the more recent uh, uh, work that people are doing. So unless unless you're confident that all of this works without any human perception, I'm inclined to think that it's you rather than us that's actually taking the, the strong view. That kind of strong coherentism, I mean, it, at least in, in epistemology, it has not been a, a winning 
a winning ticket. I would be surprised if it's a winning ticket in philosophy of science. But so, so I may be going out beyond what Karim is saying, but that's my thought on this. Yeah, yeah because, I just, because epistemologists didn't look at these in instruments. Um, well, well but no, Boaz, I think it goes further than that, which is, uh, right, like no philosopher of science is worried about the Cartesian evil demon. They think we actually traffic in causal interactions with the world. Reliabilism is the only epistemology that gives you that. So I, as far as I'm concerned, most, most philosophers of science should accept some level of reliabilism. Where there's a question as far as we're concerned, and this is something Sandy and I really agonized over, is not making brute appeals to reliability to do too much work because there's so much science that's involved in establishing a reliability claim. Uh, and I think that might be what you're tapping into, but that's why we, we're, we're very measured uh, in, in, uh, in, in appeals to brute reliability, right? It happens when people are looking at mice biting each other and stuff like that, but it doesn't happen when we're talking about uh, standard units of time or standards of measure with time, yeah. All right, we, we'll, uh, we'll leave it here for, for today. Thanks for uh, joining us today again. Uh, Sharon, the floor is yours, good to see you again. <laughs> Another measurement coherentist, I should have mentioned this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, of course, but I, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying, though, because um, my sense of what uh, coherence is, is actually uh, uh, quite broader than the ones, than the people that you mentioned. Mm. Um, so, uh, so that's actually partly what I want to talk to you about. So uh, for me, it's, it's coherence between theory, um, empirical um, data, and, uh, and, 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 prag and pragmatic considerations, mm -hmm. which include the practices of science. So that kind of goes with your functionalist um, yes. uh, point. Um, but what I was concerned about was the foundationalism <laughs> and uh, particularly the reliable perceptual uh, foundation. And because the particular thing that, that I've worked on measurement with is um, democracy. And, um, and it strikes me that you're not gonna get a, a reliable perceptual foundation there. And in fact, I've, I've argued that what you start with is you start with theory. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, there could be different points at which you start. So you start, so typically the way, the way that measuring democracy starts is it starts with um, what theories of democracy have there been? What were the main features of democracy? Let's look at, at those. Let's see if we can identify them in particular um, states and, and so on. And, and then you get this um, epistemic iteration from that mm. and you actually can get revision of theory um, mm. as a result of the other factors that come into play. Mm. So I just, um, you know, so I, that, that to me is a, a kind of coherentism Yes. which is not just statements, I guess, yeah. is probably the way you would put in. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, what I like about this is Sandy and I had worried, uh, Sandy Goldberg and I had worried uh, about uh, about how, how much early measurement is actually resolved in this way. And I think this, this is actually a really great example for us to think about because I was, I was searching for counterexamples and I didn't think of yours as an early measurement problem, but um, uh, there's a sense in which everything in the social sciences is sort of an early measurement problem to some degree. Um, one thing I'd be interested in knowing uh, uh, about um, is this is something I was thinking about. Sandy hasn't uh, hasn't heard this yet either. But I'm wondering, uh, with say uh, early measurement involving survey information, whether we wouldn't treat testimonial evidence as a sort of uh, much in the way that we're talking about perception. Um, I, I, it sounds yeah. like this is yeah. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts about that or if that figures in the democracy stuff, democracy stuff you've looked at. Yeah, actually, the uh, it, do, it does figure in the democracy mm -hmm. stuff, but it figures in later. Later. So okay. you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So it becomes a, a means of, of revising um, the theoretical understanding of democracy. But and then of course that's that's disputed. So yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, well, test, testimony is tricky in survey research. This but, I know. But then the other place to look might be um, in in well being measurement. Yes. Of well -being. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, Anna and Gil's her work. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I may be picking your brain a little bit later, Sharon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Miguel, the floor, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that was a, a very interesting talk. I learned a lot. I think particularly the uh, second part will can do a, a lot of explanatory work in making sense of much of measurement, particularly the actually the thinking about institutions like the International Bureau of, of Weights and Measures and thinking about the way that in the current system of standards, all these different concepts are intertwined and to mm -hmm. define any one of them and test of them, you need like yeah. five others, right? Uh, that's a really good uh, uh, way to, yeah, but my, what I'm, what I'm a bit more concerned, maybe like other people before me is 
whether you have a good target in the kind of accounts that uh, Chang and uh, Carla are advocating. So what I, what I was thinking is that one of the main motivations that Hasok originally had with epistemic iteration is that in these situations, you particularly lack antecedent justification in your corpus, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, how, do you, how do you justify, you know, taking temperature with your hands? If, you know, take one hand, put it into a cold water, it will measure a different temperature if you want than before. Uh, and you will have two like in non-calibrated hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so that, that and how do you how do you justify the reliance on this instrument? There is no justification. Justification comes uh, later in the process, right? Uh, so that like uh, uh, and from what I gathered, the, the way that you uh, differentiate functional uh, founda foundationalism from just a coherent, a sophisticated coherentism is to say, you know, like the justification comes from outside of. Uh, 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 outside of our corpus of knowledge. But I, I take this to be one of the motivations um, of this iterative account in the first place, that you have to start somewhere. You start with an imperfect assumption that you might or might not improve in the processes of, of using it with other other assumptions together. You know, Chang even goes, has even goes as far as, as talking about ontological principles. You know, you just have to assume that you can, that there's only a single value for each measurement. Otherwise, you know, if you like yeah, yeah, go yes. logic or something, you'll not get anywhere. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm just wondering if this, that's really a good target for the uh, kind of functional foundationalism. That yeah. was very yeah. <laughs> yeah th thank you. No, that was, um, and that was also a very, uh, I think, uh, eloquent uh, articulation of Hasek's view. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, I guess what I'm wondering is um, if there, if we can't pry apart two different kinds of cases. So I think uh, you're, when you're talking about um, uh, not having a, a trustworthy corpus, that strikes me as more of an early measurement kind of case. And the functional foundations might play a role there, but typically you need sort of um, smooth running scientific institutions for that to kind of work out, which is not what you're likely to see in early measurement. And so in those cases, what I want to appeal to is, uh, is, is the perceptual foundations. Um, and yes, right, they might be in incredibly limited, but they give you some justification. And what I want to point out is the alternative is basically, you know, having one of, of, of any number of webs, all of which are equally coherent with each other, uh, because there's nothing to say that to, to constrain one web over the other, whereas at least if you have perception providing some independent grounds for what you're doing, it seems like it, it makes that, this is where I said, it looks like uh, what you're going to be stuck with on Hasek's view with the very first early earliest of measurements is something, and he talks this way sometimes too, it's just an arbitrary starting point. Uh, and as I said, this looks to me like Kierkegaard making a leap of faith uh, when it comes to metrology. And I just don't think like that's what's going on in these cases. I think we say like, look, there's a reason we start with our senses and we don't start with like tarot cards or something like it, uh, something else, even though we can spin perfectly coherent web, equally coherent webs with tarot cards as we can, I think with, um, with our senses, if, if we're really treating these things as just a matter of coherence. So that, 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 that's really where, where I'm pointing to, but I think you're exactly right that, uh, and this is maybe an interesting point to, to hammer home, which is early measurement, um, there's also not only a, a sort of uh, paucity of, of epistemic kinds of considerations, but frequently, right, um, social institutions and science, the kinds of things that give you epistemic outsourcing, right, uh, are predicated on having some kind of track record of success um, uh, where you have some kind of division of labor and you're not likely to get that in the early measurement problem. So I think that's an excellent point. Thank you. That was very all right, wonderful. We have a bit of time if uh, anyone then wants to join us for another question. Let's give people one, two seconds to just join us. One, two, three. Well, I'll give people just uh, one, one, one minute. It's good. I, I had a question that I was listening to you and so somewhat naive question. Um, and it's, and it's partly, to be, it is, it's a genuinely naive question, not to smile, Karim. Uh, uh, I just, I was not exactly sure um, how you, what place you gave to reliable perceptual judgment. So on the one hand, we have thermometer where, of course, and I think it, it came into discussion between uh, uh, when Sandy, jumped in about uh, the, the perceptual judgment for the measurement of, 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 of clocks. Um, now, in, in the case of, of temperature, um, perception really plays a role because in a sense, our hands give us uh, a partly reliable, partly unreliable, or maybe you know, depending on, on the temperature and the conditions, uh, access to temperature itself. Now, in other cases, um, so to what we want to measure, 
right? Yeah. In other cases, perception is going to be involved in a quite different way, right? Yes. Perception is not going to be involved because we have access to the measure, to the measure round, to what we want to measure, but because mm -hmm. we, it's involved in was a very process of measuring, of collecting data. And here I'm just thinking about measuring personality. You're measuring personality. How do you do that? Well, you give people a, a questionnaire and people feel from one to seven, do you like to hang out on Saturday evening? Where do you go on vacation to your house <laughs> or, or, or to the Bahamas? You know, this kind of, of question. I right? give you a, um, an assessment of your personality. Now, perception, of course, is involved here, but in a very different way from uh, the case of, of the birth of, of, of thermometry. Right? And uh, maybe, maybe you, you drew the distinction in this case, I apologize. Um, does that matter? Uh, do, do, I mean, does that matter for you for your thinking? Uh, I mean, you know, in, in both cases, of course, reliability is involved. And, and indeed, in both cases, there is a foundationalist element, there's no doubt about yeah. that. But the significance seems to be dramatically different when some of our perception. You know, when, when perception is involved in the access to what we want to measure and we, when it's involved, I'm not sure how to describe it properly, but mm. in the tools that give us access yeah. to what we want to measure. So, so like, like when, you, when you're reading uh, like a, 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 a needle on a dial, exactly. for instance, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, 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 I was aware that this is a kind of perception. I was focused much more on the cases where you're actually detecting the, the measurable quantity. Um, I, I think that's that's because because I agree with you the significance changes significantly. Um, what's doing the heavy lifting uh, in the, the kind of early measurement cases I had in mind, like with the the, um, the mice fighting each other and stuff like that, was you know you're really actually detecting right the the the, the phenomenon of interest. That's right. Um, uh, and obviously perception can show up in other places. And yeah, I, I think. Um, uh, but but I, I take it it plays uh, as you said a less significant role in those those cases. So I'm I'm. Uh, I'm certainly significant, uh, sympathetic to that distinction. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, uh, Sandy can, can maybe correct me. I mean, I'm not an epistemologist, but, but, but I do believe that corresponds to some distinction in epistemology about uh, the way you get justification, or you must be assuming that something is the case for, for being allowed to draw an inference. Or I, I just don't remember very much about my epistemology, but I'm, doesn't that correspond <laughs> to some distinction or, or maybe I'm mistaken? There are, are several. I have to be quick though, because I have to teach in about five minutes. So okay. I, want go, I want to go prepare, but there are, there are several distinctions here, Edward, that might be relevant to what you're, what you're thinking about. One of the ones that I think may not be relevant in, uh, or, or may, you may not have thought about, but I tend to think about, again, here I'm not confident I'm speaking for Kareem, but I tend to, to distinguish between whether something is, is foundational and how significant it is, how much, how much, as what Kareem called epistemic juice it gives. Something can be foundational, but not give a lot of epistemic juice. Um, and I think that's what's going on in the case where you perceive something on the dial. Um, that, that's the way I would describe that. I don't know that Kareem would describe it that way. The other, yeah. the other point that I would make is, and this is probably what you did have in mind, there's a whole bunch of work about um, the role of presuppositions in reasoning and inference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's probably, which, and yes, that's a, there are lots of things to say there. That's a very complicated area of epistemology. So nothing to say in the one minute I have left. Great. Thanks, thanks, for, joining, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, awesome. you. thank you very much. And thank you, Kareem. Uh, thank you, and Miguel had a follow-up question or another question. And then maybe Wonderful. we probably... Really busy. Go for it, Hubert. Thanks. That's actually not a follow-up question. Okay, right? go for it. But it's, uh, so I was just wondering, again, about the um, distinction between the functional or perceptual foundationalism, like this more modest foundationalism, mm -hmm. non-grandpa foundationalism, and, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and coherentism. Uh, so it seems to me that coherentists in epistemology would want to say something that the uh, you know the justificatory relations inferential and explanatory <laughs> between the different um, statements in a corpus can have you know ver various forms of uh, uh, different logical complexity right um, so uh, couldn't the coherentist sort of escape the criticism by just saying you know what you call functional foundation is just something that has you know like very significant truth functions to a lot of other claims in my corpus but that's perfectly compatible uh, it's just it's just like uh, has just a more central uh, position in my in my uh, web of beliefs if you want um, so isn't yeah, there so like leverage for yeah um uh, I, I, you might be thinking about this differently. This is what I was hoping to address when I said, but is it really foundationalism at the end? Um, and I don't know if this is the same thought. Um, a, a lot here is going to depend, and I have to admit this is something we need to um, develop with a little bit more 
uh, sophistication and detail than we have thus far about how you can actually individuate different scientific corpuses or corpi, I never know what to say there. Um, but once again, it strikes me that um, there's at least uh, something to the idea that the Jackson lab doesn't have the same uh, corpus as, uh, as, as Hung and the, the people who are trying to develop machine learning algorithms to make sense of what's going on. That's not entirely satisfactory. I, I'll be the first to admit it. Um, I don't know if I describe those as, as central to the web because uh, if it's central to anyone's web, it looks like it's going to be the Jackson Labs web and not uh, right the, uh, the the researchers uh, doing the, the machine learning algorithm. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be the helpful way to think about it. But once again, I think the question is just really um, uh, how do you individuate different corpuses? Uh, here, here's sort of the the idea that Sandy and I, Sandy Goldberg and I, have played with. Um, which is uh, basically there's going to be certain kinds of norms within a scientific community about what you uh, you should uh, be expected to know or, or at least uh, accept um, or be aware of. I'm not quite sure what the right right word is there. Uh, all, of, all of my casual language has been destroyed by working with an epistemologist. Um, uh, and you might think that th that you could individuate corpi by the so sorts of norms uh, that are associated with each one. So the thought would be uh, there's a set of norms that we think of when we think of people who are experts in mouse behavior, uh, and that's going to be characterized by the things that you're expected to know qua specialist. Um, and that might be at least one way to make sense of it. It gets complicated uh, with Hong. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary research team, and I don't know quite what you do there. You might either have to go the route that Sandy Mitchell was sort of cautioning us uh, about, uh, or you may have to, to figure out um, uh, some, some other way of making sense of it. But it's a great question, and I really wish I had a better answer for you. But thank you. All right, thank you very much. Mark, uh, you have the last question. Go for it. Yeah, uh, thank you for letting me in. I, I had some repairman in the house, so it delayed my question here. Actually, it was a, it was a follow-up on Boaz's uh, uh, point about atomic clocks. Uh -huh. And you went, and then maybe I didn't catch the way you, you went. Maybe this is just repeating what you said. But it seems to me that there's nothing in your appeal to reliable, reliableism that requires the causal process to be in a human brain. So his story about the clocks, it seems like, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of reliable, in fact, there's a very complicated reliable process going on, mm -hmm. mediated by a bunch of modeling and computers and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it's just a causal process that gets us hooked up to some, some causally ongoing phenomena that gets us, you know, ultimately a kind of perceptual judgment. And it may, yeah. maybe that's the reading of the dial, but I, you know, why didn't the, the causal process just go all the way to you know, the, whatever it is, it's uh, decaying there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there certainly is a story to be told about that. Um, uh, one thing that uh, I was saying, I think in response to Boaz, is we don't want reliability to do the work that scientific reasons are actually doing. Right. So the, the reliability claims end up often being the achievement of the scientific reasoning mm -hmm. rather than uh, the, what's yeah. undergirding it when you're trying to make sense of, of, of the actual scientific practice. Uh, yeah. And so I think that that was our, our one concern about about. Too, too, much, too much of an appeal or too heavy an appeal to reliability. Um, yeah. But we certainly think that what you said is true, that there is a reliable mm -hmm. process that goes, um, you know, from uh, the decay to, uh, the, the, you know, someone looking at their wristwatch or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, they the wristwatch, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 the decaying wristwatch, wrist yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, so I think that's, that's um, the broad story. And then, yeah, I, I tend to think uh, just, uh, at least the way I was hoping to set this up, that just, um, uh, when we talk about reliable perceptual foundations, we don't have anything like uh, like like Iran's work on uh, on uh, contemporary measurement uh, procedures for time in mind. What we have in mind, like I said, is like thinking about the sundial or, or some early kind of measurement. And then um, there's clearly a lot of reliable social processes we think that are going on, and that's where the functional foundations are supposed to come in. Yeah, but thank you. All right, I think we've reached a one hour 30 mark. So that's the end of the QA. She said the end of the talk. You've made it, time. <laughs> and I, I told you you could end up on a bang, and that was not lying. So thank you very thank much. Thank you, Edouard. It was a really great lecture, and actually, yeah. this is quite lively and uh, an interesting QA. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Karim, and thanks to all of you for attending. Oh. And thank you. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure. pleasure. Pleasure is mine. Let's give you all. And uh, we hope to see you, or uh, many of you, uh, next semester, either at the center in person or at the online event that we will try to, uh, to maintain so that we can actually reach to a broader audience, not simply the people in Pittsburgh. Um, so have a, good, have a good summer and uh, see, you this, see, see, see you this fall. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. -bye.